Welcome to the World War I History Podcast, produced by the MacArthur Memorial. We invite you to follow us on Twitter at MacArthur1880 or find the General Douglas MacArthur Memorial on Facebook. This podcast was sponsored by the Ernst and Gertrude Tico Charitable Foundation. In F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, the character Jay Gatsby tells the novel's narrator about his World War I military service and a particularly heroic engagement in the Argonne Forest. And he ends his story by explaining, I was promoted to be a major, and every allied government gave me a decoration, even Montenegro, little Montenegro down on the Adriatic Sea. The decoration he displays is the Order of Prince Danilo I. Fitzgerald's description of the award might not be the most accurate, but it was a real order, and it is a real order, and members of the American Expeditionary Force did receive it. And today we welcome Dr. Frank Blazich back to the World War I podcast. He is the military history curator at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, and he is an expert on the members of the American Expeditionary Force that received the award, and he is also a recipient of the Order of Prince Danilo I. Welcome, Dr. Blazich. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Amanda. It's great to be back, and uh, greetings all of our listeners out there. Well, I'm so glad we could have you back on our podcast. Now, to start off with, can you tell us about the Order and how it evolved in the years leading up to World War I? So to understand the founding of the Order, we need to know a little Montenegrin history. The order itself commemorates the outcome of the Montenegrin Ottoman War, which ran from December 1852 to February 1853. Now, in 1851, Danilo I, Petrovic Nejos, succeeded his uncle, uh, Bishop Pitar II, as Montenegro's political and spiritual leader. Now, Danilo I broke with tradition, and he immediately initiated changes to transform the Montenegrin government from a theocratic to a hereditary principality. And how does he do this? Well, he travels to St. Petersburg, Russia in 1852 and actually secures a meeting with Tsar Nicholas I in, in that April. And he will greet the young man as, quote, Prince of Montenegro. And while Danilo is away in Russia, the Montenegrin Senate will also issue a proclamation regarding secularization, and they will call for Danilo to, quote, take up his position as prince. So returning to Satine, the capital the capital of uh, Montenegro back in the 19th and early 20th century, Danilo will proclaim himself Prince of Montenegro and the Hills, and he will thereafter really impose his will and consolidate his power and his position. Now, the Ottoman government, of which Montenegro technically falls under, uh, they're not really happy with this. Uh, notably, General Omar Pasha, Croatian Serb, He's in great opposition to Danilo's actions. And beginning in September, Montenegro will actually declare war against the Ottoman Empire. And soon the Montenegrin forces are going to clash with the Turkish forces in Herzegovina. And in response, Omar Pasha will then galvanize an army of 20,000 men in Albania, and he will begin preparations for a wider war. Then on 24 November 1852, the Montenegrin forces decide to suddenly attack and seize the Ottoman fortress city of Zabjek by Lake Skadar. And at the start of December, the Montenegrins will actually have to fall back as Omar Pasha's forces will recapture Zabjek, and the Ottoman navy will also blockade all of Montenegro's ports on the Adriatic. At this point, you now have 30,000 Ottomans facing off against 20,000 Montenegrins. Montenegro is not really on the ropes, but militarily it's not going as well as they would like, and they in turn will seek assistance from the Austrian and Russian empires. And on 8 January 1853, the Ottomans at this point are really advancing on two fronts. They've been suffering losses at the hands of the Montenegrins, but they're advancing on the capital of Satine and Danilo himself. Up in February, as the the kind of David and Goliath story here, both Austria and Russia will intervene diplomatically on Montenegro's behalf. Well, why is that simple? They have a vested interest in seeing Montenegro, uh, excuse me, the Ottoman Empire weak in comparison to their power. They will basically reach out to the Ottoman government, uh, particularly Austria, and issue an ultimatum. And it's essentially, it's you're going to stop fighting or else. But the real result of this is there will be a peace agreement between Montenegro and the Ottoman Empire on March 3rd, 1853, for a territorial status quo antebellum. In short, the Ottoman forces will leave, and Montenegro in turn will be recognized not as an Ottoman suzerainty, but as an independent 
country, if you will, independent entity. And it's all thanks to this diplomatic aid from Austria. Well, not one to waste opportunity, Prince Daniel I will thus establish this first Montenegrin order on 23 April 1853, what was originally known as the Order of Merit for the Independence of Montenegro. This is the Order of Danilo, the, what will be later termed the Order of Danilo I. In 1853, they just have one class, and it essentially is a silver cross uh, with the elongated lower arm. And on it, there's two inscriptions. One says, Danilo, Prince of Montenegro, and the reverse says, for the independence of Montenegro, rather cut and dry. Well, in turn, uh, there's going to be an expansion of the order in 1861 by Prince Nikolai I, later King Nikolai I. In 1861, it's three classes. In 1873, it's four classes. And by 1893, you actually have five classes of the order. And I might be leading ahead of myself, but it is by World War I that there's actually five levels, much akin to anyone familiar with the French Legion of Honor. So essentially, you have a Grand Cross, which is the first tier, a Grand Officer, second class, Commander or Knight Commander, third class, and then you have Officer and Knight. And so those are the five classes of the order. And that is what members of the American Expeditionary Force will receive uh, at the tail end of World War I. Can you describe the award for us? Uh, what does it look like by World War I? Absolutely. Now, I will caution everyone listening, go find Google, type in Order of Danilo, D-A-N-I-L-O, uh, the first, because my description of it is actually taken from the statutes for the order. Uh, these were statutes published in 1913 in Satine. And so I'm going to read this and you may be going, what in the Lord's name are this guy talking about? But here goes. Okay. So there are the five classes. The first class, and this is verbatim, a silver cross with four arms of equal size cut in a circle. A gold princely crown with floating gold band on each side at the bottom of the crown surmounts the cross. On both sides, the cross is covered with blue enamel, bordered with red enamel, and bordered with white enamel. In the center of the cross are on two sides medallions placed on a silver circle fringed at the edges. The central part of the front medallion is enameled in red and bears the golden Cyrillic letters, essentially D-I, Danilo I, surmounted by a gold princely crown with bandolettes. And think of that as like ribbon, if you will. The circle surrounding this interior medallion is enameled in blue and bears the writing on in the gold Cyrillic characters, which translate as Prince of Montenegro. A circle of white enamel surrounds the entire medallion. The medallion on the reverse of the cross is identical to the front medallion, except for the inscriptions. The inner, the red inner medallion bears the numbers 1852-3 in gold characters, and the blue circle around it bears the following inscription in gold Cyrillic characters, which translates to, for the independence of Montenegro. And now this cross is attached to the bottom of a 10 centimeter wide ribbon, which is white and it's bordered with two narrow red bands worn as a psalter on the right shoulder with the star of the order on the left side of the chest. The star itself for the order is silver. It's made out of solid silver, and it has eight rays. Uh, above is superimposed another star. So it's essentially two four-point stars kind of superimposed slightly uh, at an angle to each other. And this is designed in such a way so that all the eight rays uh, fill the interstices between the rays of the star below. So they look there's a nice uniform pattern. Uh, the superimposed star and its rays are composed of silver tweezers cut into diamonds. This is why I'm telling everyone, go find a photograph of it. It makes sense. <laughs> in the center of the upper star is spread out in front of the cross of the order described above. So that's the that that cross is really a breast star. It, it, it's You'll see these in photographs for people wearing these big breast stars. That's what that part is. But the cross itself then for the second class, third class, and fourth class are all very similar. And in this case, it is worn for these, the uh, Grand Officer and Knight Commander. Commander, the cross, as previously described, is worn on, around the neck on a ribbon six centimeters wide. Again, similar to the first class. It's slightly, it's, uh, and the cross is accompanied by a star of the order, and you wear that on the left side of the chest. Third class is, again, this same basic cross worn around the neck on the uh, white and red bordered ribbon. Fourth class is a smaller version of that cross, but it's worn then typically on a triangular ribbon, a ribbon formed into a triangle. And you'd wear that on your chest akin to almost any U.S. military decoration. Now, fifth class 
is where it gets interesting because they kept the design essentially of the original order of merit for the independence of Montenegro. And it's what is often referred to as the cross of Danilo. And it's silver, but they've put black enamel to kind of uh, fill in the inner arm, the inner of the four arms. And again, uh, then they put red enamel for the center discs on both sides. In this case, uh, the front medallion, it reads in gold Cyrillic, the word prince. And in a circle uh, all around that, it reads Danilo the first and Montenegro at the bottom. And so those are, those are the, the five designs of the order that members of the American Expeditionary Forces would be receiving in World War I. We'll have to get a picture up on our social media and stuff so people can see what we're talking about, too. Now, Montenegro was one of the smaller nations in World War I. And can you tell us a little bit about what happens to Montenegro in the early years of the war, say, prior to U.S. involvement in 1917? Absolutely. So what is rather tragic is by the time the United States enters the war in April of 1917, Montenegro has already fallen to the Austro-Hungarian forces and essentially been completely occupied and their army dissolved. How does all that happen? Well, during the Balkan Wars of 1912-1913, almost really the precursor of all the pent-up anger and emotion that will lead to the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and then the eruption of World War I, Montenegro and the other Balkan states are fighting against the Ottomans. Montenegro will be victorious. They will actually, uh, King now King Nikolai I will actually expand Montenegro's borders, but this really weakens little Montenegro's economy. They're essentially a debtor nation at this point in time, uh, and they've been weakened militarily. They've taken very heavy losses and sustained casualties over a long period of time. So this is a country that's just come out of a very dramatic war. But they're very loyal uh, to their fellow uh, Balkan states, in this case, Serbia. So Montenegro, after Austro-Hungary declares war on Serbia in August of 1914, Montenegro will follow Serbia into war, and they will in turn declare war on the Austro-Hungarian Empire on August 5th of that same year. And the Montenegrins will actually manage to mobilize a force of 50,000 troops, and they will fight alongside the Serbians against the forces of Austro-Hungary until about October 1915. And at that point, there is a combined German, Austro-Hungarian, and Bulgarian force commanded by German Field Marshal August von Mackensen. And I don't want to say the game is up at this point for Montenegro, but Mackensen will use this, will use his skill and this massive force to invade and conquer Serbia and, and, and knock Serbia out. Now, the Serbian army and the government, led by King Stefan, will opt to retreat rather than surrender. And so they will manage to actually escape through Montenegro to Albania before reaching the Adriatic. And then they'll actually, by uh, sea power, manage to get over to the island of Corfu to stay stay alive, stay as an organized force and kind of plan and prepare f- to re-engage and hopefully get back on the, across the Adriatic, re-engage and recapture Serbia. So ha- enable Serbia and its army to escape, it's the Montenegrins who are covering the Serbian withdrawal, and they're going to endure heavy losses, and and it will weaken Montenegro's overall territorial defense. So they've decided. So Montenegro has decided to stay and fight rather than retreat and live to fight another day. And they will now brace for this massive Austro-Hungarian force that's on their borders. On January fifth of nineteen sixteen, uh, the Austro-Hungarian army will invade Montenegro. And it's within three days, they're already attacking uh, the key Montenegrin positions around Mount Lovison, which is really the key to Montenegro's defense. They're going to pound the mountain with artillery. They'll even bring in their battleships and use the massive battleship guns uh, to pound the the Montenegrin positions on the mountain. And by January 11th, the Austro-Hungarians are in complete control. And this leaves the road to the capital of Satine wide open. King Nikolai will then leave the capital that same day. And within two days, the Austro-Hungarian armies are in, are in the Montenegro capital. Now, Nikolai will offer Emperor Franz Joseph I, uh, the leader of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, will offer him a truce on January 13th. And what Nikolai officer, offers is a ceasefire. And he hopes for some sort of benevolent settlement to preserve Montenegrin sovereignty and independence. Okay, fine. Well, we, we surrender. We're out. But don't, dis- you know, don't destroy us in a way. And don't, in particular, destroy his throne. But January 16th, the Austro-Hungarians said, nope, it's going to be unconditional surrender of the Montenegro army, and they must surrender all Serbian troops in Montenegro. Nikolai refuses to surrender the Serbs. He said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do this. He rejects the Austrian offer, 
And he will take his most trusted advice ministers and they will leave Montenegro on January 19th for Italy, having not signed any formal surrender. Well, what becomes then of Montenegro? Well, the control of the Montenegrin army will actually fall to one of Nikolai's generals, and he's given orders. Fight on, and if you can, join the Serbians in Corfu. But Nikolai at this point is also separate from the situation on the ground, and the general in said says, eh, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've exhausted our resources, we just, we can't, there's no way we can win, there's no hope of, of even partial victory here. So he will su- sign an instrument of surrender on January 25th, and all those Montenegrin ministers still in Satine will sign, will issue a proclamation where they essentially uh, disarm the Montenegrin army, they dissolve it. And so that's, they don't really surrender, but essentially they completely dissolve the Montenegrin army and disarm themselves. And so this is the situation, at least on the ground, for Montenegro in early 1916. But King Nikolai has not surrendered, and he still has his ministers. So there is now, in essence, a government in exile. What becomes of them? Well, first he flees to Italy, but then eventually Nikolai and his government will end up in France, and they'll end up in a burb, if you will, right outside of Paris. And the king, his court, and his diplomatic representatives are going to attempt to run a Montenegrin government in exile. The French government will agree to provide Nikolai and his retinue with a subsidy, actually, of 400,000 francs a month, so very generous, for administrative expenses and really to maintain the royal family. Uh, The French even provide the king with automobiles. He gets his own special police unit for protection. Uh, He's allowed to fly the Montenegrin flag above the villa that the French allow him to use. But the simple truth of the matter is he has no army. His government's broken. He's operating in exile. His country's occupied. The cause of Montenegro and state independence is, is kind of this unpalatable option to the other allied governments that at war. Because the, the French and the British are kind of going, the Italians, why are we going to worry about Montenegro? We have far bigger fish to fry, holding off the Germans, holding off the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And perhaps most important to all of this from the diplomatic perspective, beginning in 1914, Nikolai had really seen this as an opportunity to expand Montenegro as he had done in previous wars. He saw a chance to get more land, if you will, uh, any way he can, really expand his country, which he had made able to do for decades. But now that he's in exile, France, Great Britain, Italy, even Russia are all basically going, look, we're not interested in independent Montenegro. A far easier solution is an independent, unified Yugoslavia. Let's make this pan-Slavic state. We think that'll be a lot better. And hey, the Serbs still have an army with their king. So perhaps we can put the Serbian monarchy in charge of this, rather than Nikolai, who in essence has been defeated. And more or less, this is the position uh, that Montenegro finds himself in, and really King Nikolai I, when the United States will enter the war in April 1917. So it seems pretty obvious then that by 1917, right around the time the U.S. is getting involved in the war, that Montenegro's government in exile is very anxious for closer ties with the United States. And I think you've kind of already touched on that, but could you explain a little bit more and then how the order of Prince Danilo I plays into this diplomacy? Absolutely. So the United States enters World War I, and we pretty much committed ourselves saying, look, we're not in this war for land. We're not in this war for treasure. Uh, As President Wilson said, we're out to make the world safe for democracy, which is many people would argue really been the cornerstone of American foreign military intervention ever since uh, April 1917. In terms of Little Montenegro, what really catches the attention of Nick of King Nikolai and his government is the famed speech that President Wilson will deliver before Congress on January 8, 1918, in which he outlines the nation's war objectives and his 14 principles or points to ensure an enduring peace. And point number 11, and I'm going to read verbatim here, quote, Romania, Serbia, and Montenegro should be evacuated, occupied territories restored, Serbia accorded free and secure access to the sea, and the relations of the several Balkan states to one another determined by friendly counsel along historically established lines of allegiance and nationality, and international guarantees of the political and economic independence and territorial integrity of the several Balkan states should be entered into. Nikolai hears this and pretty much considers Wilson's statement as this American pledge to preserve the independence of his nation under the Petrovic dynasty. So this here at last is a really major player saying, I'm in it for you know, the little guy, you guys matter, we're going to ensure that you still get back what you had. Now, American 
Montenegrin diplomatic relations are still relatively new. They've only really existed since 1905. And the relations between the United States and Montenegro between 1914 and 1917 were really uh, focused on neutrality. Now, Nikolai's exiled government had attempted to establish diplomatic relations with the United States to support this Montenegrin right to self-determination. The State Department had agreed even in October 1917 to accept an ambassador uh, but it was really the British and Serbian governments, along with those Montenegrins advocating for unification with Serbia, i.e. for a future Yugoslavia, they had really mobilized and kind of, in essence, blocked Nikolai's choice of an ambassador. But it's but really, after this Wilson's 14-point speech, Nikolai begins a correspondence with President Wilson in 1918. He really begins to flatter the president. He's trying to expand upon this 11th point. And it is making progress with the president. In fact, in a letter of uh, July 10th, 1918, President Wilson will write to Nikolai and he'll note how the king and the people of Montenegro, quote, will have confidence in the determination of the United States to see that in the final victory that will come, the integrity and rights of Montenegro shall be secured and recognized. I would think for any government in exile, this is absolutely what you want to hear. Again, July 1918, this is the same time the, the United States is really, and the AEF are entering greater combat. Uh, you have Marines at Bella Wood, uh, you know, later at Soissons, you, you, we're going to see Battle of the Marne, and, and all the engagement of the Americans beginning to demonstrate they have the wherewithal and the tenacity to go up against the Germans best and beat them. Right in this time period, Nikolai is increasing his political presence in Washington. And it's going to be beginning in, in late April 1918, moving into September, that Nikolai will have his aide de camp, uh, General Dr. Anto, and I maybe, I probably am mispronouncing this, Govo Denovic as his envoy extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary to the United States. So in essence, uh, the general doctor will be the king's direct rep diplomatic representative. Washington does not object. The doctor general will meet President Wilson in the White House on September 20th, 1918, and provide his accreditation letters. And he thereafter will set up, along with a, his five-person legation, they'll set up a Montenegrin embassy or office in the Willard Hotel, right there by the White House. Uh, and even uh, during the Liberty Loan festivities in New York City on October 11th, this will, these will be declared as Montenegrin Day. And Govindanovic will speak of the dire situations in Montenegro. He'll even appoint William Frederick Dix as a consul general for Montenegro, New York. Why is Dix so important? He's a Princeton graduate and he's a close friend of President Wilson's. This is a very shrewd effort uh, by Nikolai's government to try and make inroads with not just the president, but also make inroads with somebody with, by having people who have connections with American news media and diplomats at the State Department. Dix presumably then could direct influence on the president, and in turn, this influence can be spread to State Department and help defend Montenegro's future as an independent state against those voices calling for a unified Yugoslavia. Where then does the order of Danilo factor into all of this? Well, if you have no army and your country is occupied, military decorations are still symbolic. And in this case, they could be highly symbolic of a little country and of the house of Petrovic Nijos. And they can find themselves, these medals can find their way on the chests of doughboys, which in turn will result in news stories and publications talking about this Montenegrin order and hopefully bringing recognition and attention back to the cause of Montenegro. So that makes a lot of sense to me, you know, why they would award that to members of the AEF. But in 1789, the U.S. Constitution prohibited American citizens from accepting and wearing foreign military decorations. And technically, that prohibition is still in place when the U.S. enters World War I. So what changes to allow the service members to actually wear these awards? Absolutely. So for those, I am not a, a constitutional scholar, but I can direct everyone to Article 1, Section 9. And this is part of the Constitution, quite frankly, out of a fear of America becoming an autocracy or, or any monarchy perhaps infringing on our democracy. The language of Section 9 reads, no title of nobility shall be granted by the United States, and no person holding any office of profit or trust under them shall, without the consent of the Congress, except of any present, emolument, office, or title of any kind, whatever, from any king, prince, or foreign state. What does it all mean? Well, throughout the late uh, 18th century into the 19th century, if any American diplomat or military person 
wanted to accept any type of foreign decoration, they either had to politely decline it or they had to go to Congress on an individual basis to accept any offered honors. And even if accepted, they were purely honorary. Any titles would be purely honorary. But now that America in 1917 is fighting overseas in Europe and we're training with European governments, the American opinion is really going to start to shift now about foreign decorations. In fact, in October of 1917, uh, Dr. William T. Hornaday, he's the vice president of the U.S. Army League, will write every single member of Congress and say, we got to update the nation's system of honors and insignia, mostly because there weren't really any decorations to present to American military personnel outside of the Medal of Honor, campaign medals or good conduct medals. But Hornaday brings up this issue of foreign decorations, and he says, you know, quote, the basic idea of forbidding Americans to accept and wear and to wear foreign decorations is unwarranted timidity, no more and no less. And he said, look, the time for mincing matters in this regard is, is long gone by. And this resonates with other members of Congress. In fact, Senator Charles Curtis of Kansas said he thought it was, quote, ridiculous for us to force the men decorated by France to carry their medals in their pockets. They won them fairly. Now let them wear them. And one of the kind of arch enemies, so to speak, in, in, in Congress of President Wilson, Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, in September of 1917, will actually introduce legislation to permit American citizens to wear medals or decorations received from particular foreign countries, really those foreign countries who are allied with the United States. And he would allow them to wear these upon entering the American Armed Forces. Lodge's bill gained some support, but really the first session of the 65th Congress will conclude before the legislation could be acted upon and sent to President Wilson. With the new se second session in January 1918, Lodge's bill essentially comes back and the House will hold hearings on it. And at this point, Secretary of the Navy Josephus Daniels will object openly to Americans receiving foreign decorations. His attitude is, American, those members of the American military really need to focus on their job and their military and their own country for decorations. If you want to be recognized, then do good work for the United States and you'll be recognized. And yet days after this, on March 26, the Senate will introduce a joint resolution to permit all members of the military or the naval forces of the United States serving in the present war to accept decorations from allied governments. This really comes in in response to remarks from AEF Commander General John J. Pershing, who had wired in on March 22nd asking for permission for his soldiers in France to wear the decorations they had been receiving from the French and British governments. And Pershing also noted here, quote, decorations carefully bestowed would contribute to good feeling and closer relations with our allies, i.e., you know, guys, we can also give American decorations to the French and British, and this will really be beneficial to all the countries involved. Getting to the point here, on May 20th, the Senate will adopt uh, an amended joint resolution authorizing American military personnel to accept foreign decorations. It also authorizes the president to confer American medals and decorations on allied military personnel. This eventually, this resolution will be bundled into the Army Appropriations Bill for 1919, which President Wilson signs into law on July 9th, 1918. This act which is still in the books, authorizes American citizens serving allied militaries or with field services of allied nations the right to wear foreign military decorations received on entering military service with the United States. And it also allowed all members of the U.S. military to accept during the present war in one year thereafter decorations from allied governments with the consent of Congress by Clause 8 of Section 9 of Article 1 of the Constitution. And this is this remains really the foundation for the wear and acceptance of foreign military decorations by members of the United States military, as well as for the United States military conferring American decorations on foreign governments. Wow, that's absolutely fascinating. Do we know how many members of the American Expeditionary Force actually received the order and what class of award did most of them receive? So the most accurate figure I've ever found in my research is actually from a uh, War Department report as of 30 June 1924, where they reported to Congress that 124 members of the Army had received the order in the classes of one Grand Cross, which is General Pershing, 10 Grand Officers, 62 Commanders, 20 Officers, and 31 Knights. And the Marine Corps also reported that they had two officers receive the uh, the class of knight or fifth class in the order of Danilo the first. So 126 in total is the best figure I have. Not counting Jay Gatsby, by the way. Right. Not counting Jay Gatsby. Now, 
I've looked at a list of some of the recipients and I see Lewis Brereton, Charles P. Summerall, John Quickmeyer, and several others that all have connections to Douglas MacArthur. And of course, being the MacArthur Memorial, um, I have to ask a question about him. So why is Douglas MacArthur not on that list? I mean, do we know how the recipients were actually selected? This is probably the, this has been the trickiest part of research is to understand why did some receive it and others did not. The hard reality is I don't have a good answer as to why some Americans get recognized and others do not. A handful of the awards were presented by King Nikolai I, particularly General Pershing's. What I do know is that in that immediate aftermath of the war from about 1919 to 1920, quite a few AEF veterans received the decoration in the mail. They literally received the the decoration and their brevet or certificate in the mail. In most cases, postmarked from the United States. This would be Dix himself, most likely from the as consuls sending the uh, the decorations. They also never included a citation, so there's no clear explanation as to why some receive it and others do not. Again, the exact rationale employed by Nikolai in the government exile, it's unknown. It's really speculative. In fact, I've reached out to the National Archives in Montenegro. They said the where they do not know the whereabouts of the ledger listing all the order all the orders recipients from the Kingdom of Montenegro. The ledger is missing. And that would include the precise list of those American recipients and the date and the number of their brevet, because all the brevets are individually numbered. And also, not every recipient of the order received news coverage in the American press, which has made it kind of tricky to identify who are those 126 Americans. Really, my research had probably identified 75 or 80, maybe 83 percent. But there's still this small number that I just don't know why they never got it. Why did Douglas MacArthur receive so many other foreign decorations and not the order of Danilo I? I simply don't know. So Jay Gatsby's got one one up on him there. Okay. So tell us about some of the other notable recipients though, because it's a very, very fascinating list of Americans. This was probably the most fun uh, researching is first off you go, okay, well, who got it? And then once you have their name, you're like, well, who is this person? Some of them are, are obvious, others really less so. Now, I'd mentioned that King Nikolai did present the medals personally to a handful of Americans, General Pershing being the first. Perhaps most notable was something called the Inter-Allied Games. And these were held in Pershing Stadium in Paris from June 22nd to 6 July 1919. Since the Summer Olympiad was not held during World War I, in a way, this is the first Olympic-esque games held. And King Nikolai was there. And those athletes that really impressed him with their performances, he would summon to his luxury box, if you will, or spot in the bleachers, I guess. And he personally knighted them all. And they actually received the officer grade, but they made all became, quote, Montenegro knights. And among those, uh, notably, was Sprinter Army Second Lieutenant Charles W. Paddock, who at one point, I think, held the U.S., maybe the world record in the 100-meter dash. Uh, He would actually go on to win two gold medals in the 1920 Summer Olympiad. And also Private Edward Solomon Butler, or Saul Butler, who was, as far as I know, the only African-American recipient of the order. He won the long jump on June 28th, just blew everyone away with his, his athletic prowess. And his getting decorated by King Nikolai achieved exactly what the king wanted. It made news all across the United States. A huge amount of press coverage about Solomon Butler being knighted. Other notables, there's at least 11 that I've documented, re- recipients of the U.S. Medal of Honor, who also received the Order of Prince Daniel I. Lieutenant Colonel Charles Whittlesey, commander of the famed Lost Battalion, which had been surrounded in the Argonne Forest and held off German attacks from the 2nd through the 7th of October 1918. He received the grade of commander in the mail on 14 June 1919. In many ways, Whittlesey may well be the model for Jay Gatsby. His sec- Whittlesey's second command, a Major George McMurtry, who also received the Medal of Honor for his heroine, heroism aside, Whittlesey, he received the Order of Prince Daniel I and the class of officer. So Whittlesey received the one grade higher than McMurtry. And likewise, he received his in the mail, but at least the brevet in the mail, he apparently did not get the actual medal until 1923. Why that is, again, I don't know. Uh, Captain Samuel Woodfeld, uh, Woodfeld, he would receive the order also on 14 June 1919. So you have three Medal of Honor recipients all getting it on the exact same day. 
And yet Woodfill receives the medal in the class of knight, the fifth class, even though he receives his medal of honor for personally silencing three German machine gun positions. Just an incredible feat of valor and incredible bravery. In fact, uh, Woodfill will be named by Pershing as the greatest hero of the war and made the infantry representative body bearer for the unknown soldier at his internment in Arlington National Cemetery on 11 November 1921. And Whittlesey and McMurtry are also in attendance. So there you have three Danilo knights all in one place. Pershing is the only Grand Cross recipient, and we do have that decoration here at the Smithsonian. Uh, but 10 other officers will receive the order in the class of Grand Officers, and these are all either Brigadier or Major Generals, all flag officers. Among those, we have uh, Major Generals Charles Summerall, Edward Lewis, James Harbord, and Brigadier Generals Henry Allen, Harry Bandoltz, uh, Robert Davis, George Harries, William Hartz, James McAndrew, and I think it's Frank McCoy is the last. Again, who are these people? Some quick notables. Uh, Summerall is actually the commander of the 1st Division in the war. He later is going to serve with the American Peace Commission and will go on to be Chief of Staff of the Army from 1926 to 1930, I believe just before Douglas MacArthur, if memory serves. And you can correct me on that, Amanda? Yes. Yes, he was. General Lewis, uh, he commands the 3rd Brigade of the 2nd Infantry at Chateau Thierry before he'll take command of the 30th Division, which will break the Hindenburg Line in, in fall of 1918. Uh, General Harvard, he starts the war as Pershing's Chief of Staff. He will later then be succeeded by McAndrew, and Harvard thereafter will command the 4th Marine Brigade and lead the Marines to immortality at Belle Wood and Soissons before he becomes the AS Chief of the Services of Supply. And General Allen, he achieves his fame really post-war as commander of American forces in Germany and as the military governor of the American zone of occupation from 1919 to 1923. Some of the recipients of the class of commander will end up being general officers in World War II. Uh, Louis Brereton will rise to the rank of lieutenant general in the U.S. Air Force, although he also has a MacArthur connection here because he starts the war in command of the Far East Air Force in the Philippines, which, for other podcasters probably know, didn't end so well. And the Far East Air Force is annihilated really before it gets a chance to enter the fight. Doesn't end well at all. No, not at all. And he'll <laughs> end the war in Germany uh, commanding the first Allied Airborne Army. Uh, James E. Cheney, he will rise to become a major general. He actually is an observer in Great Britain. And then he is the actual commander of the Army's European Theater of Operations until June 1942 when some whippersnapper named Major General Dwight Eisenhower comes to replace him. Cheney ends the war commanding all military forces on Iwo Jima. James A. Ulio is a name that, for anyone who researches the Army in World War II, has probably seen his name before because he rises to Major General and he will be the Adjutant General of the Army from 1942 to 1946, responsible for the classification and assignment of well over 8 million soldiers. Lastly, Edgar Hume uh, is one of the most decorated medical officers in U.S. Army history. He's going to serve on the staffs of Eisenhower, as well as Mark Clark, and he'll end the war as a major general and chief of the military government of the U.S. zone of Austria, in fact. What about some other interesting recipients as we work down the grades here? And these are either in the class of Commander Officer Knight. One is Arthur W. Kipling, who's in fact the second co cousin of Rudyard Kipling, and he's going to be an organizer of an American ambulance service with the French Army in 1914. This is later going to evolve into the American Field Service. And in fact, Kipling will transfer to the Army in 1917, and he's later one of the founding organizers of the American Legion, and will command the Legion's post in Paris. One of the ambulance drivers uh, for the American Field Service is also Donald M. Call, who's going to serve with the French Army until he transferred to the U.S. Army's Tank Corps in 1918, he will go on to receive the Medal of Honor after pulling his wounded officer uh, from their badly hit tank, and he carries him over a mile under enemy fire to safety. A name that may be a little more familiar to people is Kermit Roosevelt. Uh, he's the son of the 26th president, and he's rather active in Theodore Roosevelt's pre-war expeditions to Africa and South America, of which the National Museum of Natural History has quite a few animals that uh, President Roosevelt collected, if you will, on display or in storage. And Kermit Roosevelt will serve also with the British Army in Mesopotamia. He is decorated by the British as well, then transfers to the U.S. Army, and he ends up fighting at the 1st Division in the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. The last, but by far, I think the coolest recipient is Cavalry Officer Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson. He's going to begin the war on a diplomatic, kind of a secret diplomatic mission as a both liaison and intelligence officer to the Japanese embassy in Siberia. He then, like, ends the war uh, commanding cavalry in the American occupation forces in the Rhine, 
he will receive, I think he's an officer, might be a commander in the uh, Order of Danilo. After he'll leave the army, kind of under a degree of controversy, and he'll turn to writing. In 1934, he's going to found National Allied Publications to publish the very first American comic book with all original materials. So for the first time, it's a comic book that all the comics are brand new. They've never previously been published. And three years after founding National Allied Publications, Wheeler Nicholson co-founds Detective Comics Incorporated. And we know this today as DC Comics, which of course is home to Superman, Batman, and movies that are always in competition with the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But we'll keep this politically correct, and we will not talk about whose superhero movies are better than the others. Right. It's just an absolutely amazing who's who of the United States and the U.S. military. So I thought that was really, really interesting. To sum things up, did the order of Prince Danilo I accomplish what the government of Montenegro hoped it would accomplish during and in the immediate aftermath of World War I? Unfortunately, no. It certainly, to be a recipient of the Order of Prince Danilo I, it brought a lot of pride to this select group of AF veterans. But these were very generous gestures by the Montenegrin government in exile, but it just did not alter kind of the, the momentum of diplomatic events. The United States, particularly President Wilson, we, we just simply did not provide for the restoration of King Nikolai's kingdom. The Allied powers all decided to recognize the kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes under King Peter I of the, the Serbian uh, monarchy, and then he'll thereafter be succeeded by his son, King Alexander I in 1921, who I later believe will, it's under his reign that the kingdom of Yugoslavia comes into being. In 1921, on March 1st, uh, Nikolai will die near Cannes, France, uh, clutching a handful of dirt that he took from Montenegro when he fled in 1916. And sadly, months prior, on 30 December 1920, Wilson's government decided to withdraw recognition of independent Montenegro. In fact, on January 21st, 1921, the State Department revoked the letter's patent for Dix. Quote, in view of the present status of Montenegro, this government, the U.S., no longer considers it necessary to accord recognition to our diplomatic and consular officers. There's still a kind of royal Montenegrin government in exile in Rome, but the flame is dying out, so to speak. And in a way, those recipients of the Order of Danilo I, the United States, not being blood you know, Montenegrin, so to speak, by blood, they're really the ones who will keep the memory alive uh, of an independent Montenegro under King Nikolai I. So the order still exists today, and you are a recipient of it. So would you like to tell us about that? I, I can neither confirm nor deny that there is a secret handshake. There is no secret handshake, true not. Uh, but to, to kind of bring explain you know, how the, art, the order, quote, fell into abeyance and brought back, it really ties into the collapse of the end of the Cold War and kind of the collapse of, of, of really communist Yugoslavia. In October 1989, the remains of King Nikolai, his wife, and three of their daughters get reburied in Satine after essentially resting in Italy for the bulk of the century. Communist Yugoslavia will break up. There'll be 14 years. Montenegro will be linked with Serbia and what is first the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia and later the State Union of Serbia and Montenegro. But nine, almost 90 years in change after being occupied by Austria-Hungary in 21 May 2006, the Montenegrin people will approve a referendum to make Montenegro once more an independent state. And on 3 June, the Montenegrin parliament will declare independence and President George W. Bush will recognize this new Republic of Montenegro, uh, which will then become the 192nd United UN member on June 28th. But in the year just prior to Montenegrin independence, there were only two living knights of the order, Prince Nikolai of the House of Petrovic Negos and Prince Dmitri Romanov. And they decided to reactivate the order and rekindle interest in the decoration, its history, and in essence, the history of the Kingdom of Montenegro. And they decided to operate under the 1893 statutes. And the order has grown since then over the past 17 years to number. It's only about several hundred knights in Europe, Asia, and the United States. There are currently uh, recipients who are active members or veterans of the U.S. Army and U.S. Air Force. I think there might be a U.S. Navy veteran there, but I'm not sure. And in many ways, they are the contemporary successors of those Montenegro knights forged in Europe and the Mediterranean by General Pershing and the AEF. These are mostly professionals, but the order rem remains is always an order of merit. 
So it is an order that you get it for your meritorious contributions to either Montenegro or in many cases, your contributions to humanity. So a number of the folks who have received it have received it for their, in my case, work for public history. Other people have received it for their work in medicine or business or diplomacy, so forth and so on. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing this with us. It's my pleasure and it's always great to be here and support the MacArthur Memorial. Thank you for listening. If you have questions, suggestions, or comments, we want to hear from you. You can find us on Twitter at MacArthur1880, on Facebook as the General Douglas MacArthur Memorial, or you can email MacArthurMemorial at Norfolk.gov.